Um, hi everyone, uh, thanks for waiting. Um, I'm Raisa and I'm the deputy editor of Himal and um, I'm just here to introduce Screen South Asia, which if you're joining for the first time, it's our monthly screening of documentaries in collaboration with um, Film South Asia. Um, at the outset, I have to say a big thank you for Situ Alok from Film South Asia, who's been partnering with us for the past year. Um, this is actually going to be his last um, edition with us and we'll be taking it forward, but just wanted to say uh, thank you so much for all your help and uh, collaboration on this. And we've really enjoyed this and we hope to continue uh, this in the future as well. Um, also wanted to say a big thank you to uh, Deepa Danraj, who is here with us today. And we're going to discuss um, her film, We Have Not Come Here to Die. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Deepa. Um, I think your film is a really important work, which kind of talks about the issue of caste discrimination. And um, also your name was uh, mentioned last week um, during a film screening in Sri Lanka with Serala Emanuel, where she thanked you for your um, help with some of the documentaries. So oh. it's always nice to see people collaborating across borders, um, you know, when it comes to film as well. Um, so yes, without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to Alok and Roman. Uh, Roman? Oh, sure, I can jump in. Um, I just want to say a very quick but very important round of thank yous, um, echoing what Raisa was saying. Um, Deepa, thank you so much for, for your work, I mean, on this film and just your work more broadly. Um, I think on this film, it's a difficult watch, I think. Um, I mean, I, I, I still remember, I mean, India and, and the, the atmosphere and the shock um, after Rohit took his own life. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that it's strange to feel like now it's something that's passed into history, but also because there's been so many attempts to warp the story, so much disinformation. I think that cutting through all of that and one testament, if there is one document, one testament that will, I think, stand the test of time in terms of just telling the story as it really was, and also the context, mm -hmm. the indictment of the Indian higher education system, but also caste society more broadly. Mm -hmm. And we have to remember that as much as this is a film based in India, caste is a poison that cuts across all of our borders. And I think that's mm -hmm. also very important. And I think that in, in 50 years time, I know that this is going to be probably one of those films that um, we keep coming back to. There's not that many documentaries that are that way, but I think that given the, the gravity of what happened at the University of Hyderabad mm -hmm. in 2016, and also everything that has happened since, I, I feel very confident in saying that this is going to be one of those documentaries that people keep coming back to for 50 years. Um, it's Dalit History Month, I think um, a, a time to celebrate the things that the movement has gained, but also to mourn a lot of people like Rohit who were taken by that system. Um, so I just hope that in 50 years time, when somebody else is watching this documentary, it's a better subcontinent that caste has relaxed its its terrible stranglehold at least more than it has today. Um, so thank you for your film. Um, I think that the, the last thing I want to say before I, I um, hand back to Alok and Raisa is really just a big, big thank you to Alok. Alok, it's crazy that it's been a year um, 13, 14 months ago, I, th I think we started this conversation just as a wild dream, being like, why can't we do an online, I mean, with Zoom and everything, why can't we just do an online film festival once a month? Um, now we've grown that community, I think, to more than a thousand people signed up, um, hundreds of people watching the documentaries every time we put them up. It's been so good to see it come good. And you know, without me having to say it, but I will say it here because it's important to say in front of everyone, this would never have happened without you. Thank you so much. We will miss you and we will try and carry this forward as best we can. Um, so with that, the biggest thank you of the evening to all of you who have watched and joined us. Thank you for being here. I'll hand you back to um, to um, Raisa and Al. Yeah, thank you so much, Roman and Raisa. Um, I'm gonna quickly introduce Deepa. Uh, Deepa Dhanraj is a writer and award-winning filmmaker and has been actively involved in the women's movement with a focus on political participation, health, and education for more than four decades. 
She is one of the founding members of Yugantar, a feminist film collective that produced pioneering films about women's labor and resistance to domestic violence. The caste question and the and the myriad forms of discriminations that Dalits experience and the rise of Dalit assertion is another theme that Deepa Dhanras explores in, her, in many films. She has a special interest in education and has worked extensively with the government schools to create pedagogy surround, uh, suited for problems faced by first-generation learners who come from the uh, Dalit and Adivasi communities. Deepa's films have been screened and awarded at national and international film festivals such as the Mumbai International Film Festival, International Documentary Film Festival, Amsterdam, Berlinale, Doc Leipzig, Oberhausen Film Festival, and Film South Asia, Kathmandu, among others. Welcome, Deepa. Thank you for, yeah, thank you for screening the film and thank you for inviting me to this session. Over to you, Raisa. Sure. Um... Hi, Deepa. So just to kick off things, um, you know, as a filmmaker, you followed a lot of um, protest movements, including women's movements as well. Um, so how soon after the these protests began at the University of Hyderabad, how soon did you start uh, following them? And what made you decide that it was something that was worth documenting? Um... You know, this this, this uh, film was very unusual for me because uh, normally most of my work, I, I don't even start shooting unless uh, I've done a lot of research. I spend a lot of time on research and, uh, and that's only after that do I get into the field with equipment and things. So this film, well, first off, you know, I am from Hyderabad. Hyderabad is... Uh, um, is in a sense my city, um, even though I don't live there now. But um, and uh, as somebody who who is connected to Hyderabad, um, you know, Rohit's death wasn't the first suicide of a Dalit research scholar in Hyderabad Central University. It was the ninth. Okay. So you know, one is aware of 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 uh, what's happened uh, prior, and also other things. You know, for example, there was a High Court judgment. Uh, about certain measures that had to be put in place in the uni in, in, on campus. Uh, they needed an ombudsman. It was about counseling. There, there were many, many recommendations, um, none of which, of course, were implemented or followed. So I knew about, uh, I, I knew about uh, that history. But I think in this case, what happened was, it was just Rohit's letter. I think uh, as soon as he... Uh, passed away, the students, um, actually one of the students who's in the film, Munna, he, uh, he really, um, he photographed the letter immediately. As I mean, they, he, he sort of entered the room literally with the police or just before the police and he photographed the letter and they uploaded the letter at once. And when I spoke to Munna later, he said it's because they didn't want uh, the police to produce a different narrative. So it was very important that the letter get out. And so very soon after his death, the letter was circulating, you know, and it had become viral in a sense. And I think that I was so moved by the letter, you know, and um, and somehow it, it is a very uh, bizarre decision. I just told my partner who's also, um, uh, who also does all the camera work for our films. So... I said, you know, let's just go to campus. Let we, uh, you know, so we were there literally three days after the incident, and with not a very clear idea in mind, but just in a sense of wanting to be there, you know. Um, that's how it started. I mean, and we just um, we just go every day. You know, the campus had become a hotbed of activity. Students were coming from all over India. Uh, to express solidarity. There were civil society groups in Hyderabad who were there. And of course, all kinds of opposition party leaders who thought this is a good opportunity. So so we that's how it began. And after that, I think um, I just felt that this is a very, very important movement, almost a historical movement, because, you know, the, as I told you, the previous nine suicides, for example, um, on campus, and you know, it's a huge campus. It's like maybe eight, 9,000 students, right? 
So the previous suicides, it was, you know, you would only have students from the Dalit community or other marginalized groups who would protest or who, who even would come out. Um, but Rohit's death, um, I think it, dis it disturbed thousands of students on campus. And I think for the first time, there were students from all communities, all castes who were there, you know, uh, united. Also teachers, I mean, there's a concerned teachers group. There were about more than 150 of them, faculty who were supporting students. And so you, you really felt that there is a shift, you know, there's something here that's changed, okay? That, and it wasn't just in HCU, but because of, um, uh, what do you call it? I mean, Facebook, students are in touch, you know, you have this whole digital universe. The, the protests in JNU started literally a day later, and then you, you'll be talking about Bombay, you're talking about Ahmedabad, Guwahati, Chennai. I mean, it just exploded, you know, campus after campus. And so in that sense, I think initially, I just felt it's really important to record, really important to document this. This is, um, this is somehow shifting the conversation on caste and particularly caste discrimination in higher education. Um, yeah, that, that's uh, how it started. It's a sort of long, sorry. It was no, that's, Yeah. That's totally fine. I, I feel like maybe you answered part, part of this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Can you tell us a little bit more about the protesters and like, you know, the kind of, kind of people you met while filming? Like, you know, you mentioned it was not just students. Uh, my question was going to be, was that was it a mix of people? So, but could you tell us a little bit more about the protesters and kind of people? Well, of course, uh, initially, of course, it was the students, and uh, they had formed a joint action committee on campus. So you had almost fourteen um, student organizations um, who had formed formed this group, and Ambedkar Students Association was one of them, but. Uh, which is the group that uh, Rohit belonged to, uh, but there were there were many. I mean, there was SFI, there were there was another Dalit organization. I mean, so um, you had uh, so that that group, the the Joint Action Committee, for example, was the group that was um, really dealing with press. Uh, also, all the communications with the university administration. And I was just so impressed with how they were handling what was basically a very um, hostile or, you know, ambiguous national press. Um, you know, there were TV cameras there all the time. There were these OB vans and, um, uh, and, and, and these are students who'd never faced, uh, a, you know, a, a camera before in that sense, like, you know, to go on to national television. And um, they were incredible. I mean, really incredible. So I felt like that was the core group that was organizing the protest. But there were a lot of students who, who maybe didn't belong to a, a political organization per se, but who would turn up, who were interested. And then there was a lot of civil society support from outside, from Hyderabad. Uh, many groups that decided to support students who would visit and um, and these groups in fact later when things uh, you know the, you, you see it in the film also when after Aparao comes back and students get arrested that uh, even in the question of raising bail or um, you know uh, even fighting court cases for students um, so those groups are also part of it uh, yeah so it was um, it was something that I think um, it was, and there were also students from other universities, other campuses in Hyderabad who, who joined, like Osmania University, for example, or Nizam College, other places. Um, other, there was another central university, JNTU, those students arrived. Yeah, so uh, in that sense, it was, it was huge. I mean, uh, you know, you, you had uh, uh, incredible amount of, um, the support and solidarity. Students were also traveling from all over India, you know, to be there for two days, three days. I mean, students came from the Film Institute where already they'd had a 100-day uh, protest and strike. 
um, Film Institute Pune. There were students from TISS Bombay who arrived, uh, also from Chennai, and even district colleges in Maharashtra. So it was, um, yeah, it had just become a place. Uh, to be there in solidarity, also I think collectively to feel, to feel your strength, you know, in in some sense because of the forces ranged against them. Um, yeah, I think that that. It's, um... Thank you for that, and um, also curious. I mean, um, about the roots of the movement and how spontaneously it began. I think you said that um, you went there about three days after the protests happened. Um, yeah. Um, so did the did the protests actually erupt? I mean, as you mentioned, this was also the ninth um, death uh, that had happened on this on this campus. Yeah. Um, so was it sort of immediate after yeah. death was announced or did it take a while for people to organize? No, I think it was almost immediately. I mean, uh, students on campus, in fact, uh, they wanted cases against the administration and the union ministers to be filed immediately. You know, um, uh, so um, see, prior to that, uh, you know, the students had been camping out, right, on, on campus in, in Bellivara, which is the Dalit ghetto on campus. And Rohit had written that... Uh, He'd written that very painful letter, you know, which was ignored, uh, asking for ropes and cyanide and whatever, you know. Uh, um, so a certain set of students was already very aware of what was happening, right? In the sense of that there had been three suspension orders that, you know, if you look at the, the kind of punishment, it was so disproportionate to what had happened. I mean, it, it's it's a crazy, just think about it. One Facebook post and, you know, students are scrapping all the time. I mean, you know, they, it's not, it wasn't even physical. It was just, um, but because of the, because of the connection between the ABVP, a union minister, you know, and the fact that you had uh, a BJP government at the center, uh, that it, it just got so, um, out of hand. I mean, so students were following the suspension orders, etc. All that that was happening, but I think his death was so um, shocking. I, I, so, or, I mean, you you hear it in the film as well. You know, they didn't even they protected his body all night till literally the police had to, um, you know, do a lati charge and uh, arrest students, and it was. Um, yeah, so I think it was it was instant. I mean, instantaneous, really. Yeah, but the background as to what was happening was already being shared earlier, you know, with students in JNU, with in other other central universities as well. So, yeah. Um, you were student in Hyderabad yourself, and you've said uh, that at times there was a lot of uh, student politics back when you were student. Did you see similarities yeah. between the movements and political factions back then and in the aftermath of Rohit's death? Well, I mean, um, see, when I was a, in Osmania, it was a very different time. It was in the 70s. And um, th that kind of... Uh, th so there was there, there were uh, uh, student groups at that time who were in influenced by um, radical left groups. Uh, they were very active. Then you also had the beginnings of uh, groups who were interested in statehood for Telangana, the Telangana state, uh, those kinds of things. Then you had the progressive organization of women who were uh, the first feminist, in fact, student group ever in India. Um, so it was a very active time, right? As far as uh, direct links as to what survived, I would say that there were certain civil society groups, for example, who share the same uh, politics, who helped out. But as far as those kind of uh, student groups that existed in the 70s, um, there was some, I don't know, I can't say directly that there was that kind of support, but there were a lot of groups from Osmania, uh, particularly Dalit student groups that were very much part of uh, 
supporting what was happening. Yeah. Thank you for that. And um, you were just talking about how uh, through the university, there are these linkages between um, the BJP um, and these groups like the ABVP. Um, could you also talk about how prevalent that is, not just in Hyderabad, but, you know, um, in the system of higher education in India, you know, how this entwining of student politics and politics happens? Yeah. Well, in, you know, in India, that uh, uh, political parties, for example, right, the, the Congress or uh, Communist Party Marxist or the BJP, they all have student wings. These are student wings of parties. So, um, in fact, to rise in the party, many leaders emerge from student wings of these parties, right? Um, so, the this is uh, this is very alive and well in India. This is a you know it's a long history, and the ABVP actually the Akhil Vidya Bharatiya Parishad is actually a student wing of the RSS, you know, which is uh, the which is in a sense not a party but it is part of um, um, you you must know what the RSS is right so. Uh, so when they say Sang Parivar, or the, the family, the, this family, uh, it includes the RSS, the BJP, ABVP, and uh, Bajrang Dal, which is their uh, many, many of these organizations. So, uh, so student politics, I mean, there are elections on campuses, and uh, these are bitterly fought. And um, uh, in a sense, the they are also these student groups are very responsive to what is happening with national politics right so if you see you just take the rohit uh, incident um the fact that it all started with the screening of a film and that documentary film actually was uh muzaffar nagar baki hai or muzaffar nagar eventually was a film about an election in in uttar pradesh in muzaffar nagar where um, but they were the election, and prior to the election, there was um, there were basically communal riots or sectarian riots between Hindus and Muslims, which were in which um, so the film actually reveals that how some maybe these riots were engineered, and finally the the kind of polarized atmosphere that this communal politics created. Uh, led to the BJP winning that election, you know. Now that this film is being screened in Hyderabad, but ABVP will of course take objection to this version uh, of what happened in Uttar Pradesh. So you see what I mean about they are even defending uh, or or they feel that these kind of narratives are, uh, these kind of narratives maybe show the BJP in a bad light or they want to discredit the narrative totally. And uh, that's how the Rohit thing started because when they tried to show the film in Hyderabad, it, the film screening was disrupted. And uh, the Facebook post that they po that the ASA people posted is about the ABVP goon. Uh, I mean, sorry, the, no, no, the Facebook post that the ABVP president posted uh, was about uh, the Ambedkar Students Association being goons, goons or you know, thugs, or whatever you call it. We use the word goons. And, and that's how it starts, right? So there is a way in which whatever is happening nationally, politically, uh, also is a long shadow in, uh, on campuses, in campus politics. Thank did you. Did I answer your question, Raisa? Yeah, you did. Okay. Um, uh, the film notes that there is a change in consciousness after Roy's death. Um, perhaps in Hyderabad, would you say that there's been a change when it comes to caste discrimination in higher education in India? I, you know, it's very hard to... Um, is, uh, I, I, I mean, it's very hard, like the indicators, what I would look at, which would be more positive indicators, is that um, there has been an opening up, uh, uh, for example, a lot of conversation now about caste discrimination, which didn't exist earlier. Uh, the other thing is that there have been um, formation of um, 
Dalit student groups on campuses, even new ones, right? Um, and these organizations then, of course, take up these questions. Um, so that has also started as a kind of political mobilizing around caste on campuses with newer, newer student organizations. So that's also an encouraging sign, I would say. So I would look at it in terms of a shift in consciousness, I would say, with students. But as far as the administration goes, and as far as um, what's happening with um, access for marginalized groups to enter higher education, it's not such a happy story. Because post that and post um, the issues also in JNU, um, you know, the, the Ministry of higher, ed higher Education has come down very hard. So, you know, see, in India, you cannot openly say that you will, no party can say that they will stop uh, uh, reservations, okay, affirmative action, reserving a certain number of seats for groups who have been historically uh, marginalized or, you know, face that kind of deprivation. But there are ways, you know, you can uh, create a situation where it really becomes very difficult for these students to enter. And I think one of the things that has been done, and just a small example, many things administratively have been done, but one of the big things, especially for PhD level, is that earlier universities could conduct their own entrance exams. And uh, those exams were, um, in a sense, I think much more, uh, much more fair for students and from all communities, but definitely for marginalized groups. Now, uh, we have the University Grants Commission, which has declared that there will be a national entrance test, which means that, firstly, universities have lost their autonomy, number one. And, you know, a vice chancellor in India has the same rank as a cabinet minister. You know, I mean, you think about it, like, right? So they've lost their autonomy in, in the sense of uh, curriculum uh, or um, even the test or even the kind of courses they would like to offer. But the thing with the national entrance test is that the kind of paperwork required to, to do it, you know, to actually uh, um, even uh, do that exam. And we have an extremely lucrative coaching industry, okay, a tutoring industry, I would say, where students end up paying lakhs of rupees just to figure out how to clear these exams, these competitive exams. And because the NET is not, is, is not really so qualitative as an exam, you know, it's more, um, I don't know what they call them, you know, those, uh, what is that called? Those uh, different choice, you know, those kind of- Multiple choice. Yeah. Yes, choice. multiple choice, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, or, you know, formats like that, which really are not so analytical, but uh, more fact-based, et cetera. So this kind of, uh, so this very lucrative coaching industry is something students from these groups cannot even afford. You know, you, you can't pay those kind of amounts just to figure out how to crack that NET, right, that exam. So there is a way in which really it's going to be very, very difficult for students to, uh, you know, get admission, okay? And the other thing about the UGC, for example, I, I don't know now, but definitely a year later, maybe I shouldn't even say this, but this has to be fact-checked, is that, you know, it was, it was supposed to be a committee, okay, of scholars. Uh, so they had to be in-service teachers, they had to be, you know, subject specialists, they had to be, et cetera. Right now, there are two members and, and three central government appointees. And the appointees are not teachers. They're not even teachers, okay? And now this is the body, the, the national premier body that is going to decide um, everything related to higher education. From, um, from curriculum, admission, everything, okay? And, oh yeah, I forgot to tell you one more thing. So the NET um, will also decide, now this is very important for students from marginalized groups, it's called the JRF, which is a, 
a fund or a stipend or a, some, you know, a junior research. I, I'm not. I'm not going to expand that because I'm not sure. But, but the thing is that even the JRF, the 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 power to decide JRF candidates will also rest with them. And most of the and now, how can students from marginalized groups even attempt higher education without this uh, this fund, without this uh, scholarship? So you see what I'm saying. Without openly dismantling affirmative action. You can create many uh, hurdles, like you know, infrastructural and, and systemic, that makes it very difficult for these students to enter. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, really comprehensive overview, Deepa. Uh, before I go on to the next question, I also want to tell everyone who's listening that if you have any questions for yeah. Deepa, um, please drop them in the chat box and um, we'll take them up um, after we finished our round of questions. Um, I also wanted to ask a question on accountability. Um, you were already talking about several measures that were being discussed in the aftermath of Rohit's death, including um, an ombudsman. And you've also yeah. mentioned this UGC committee um, that was, I believe, um, filed out, um, set up after a case filed by both uh, Radhika and the parent of another student. Um, so, yes, I mean, I know you've answered this briefly before, but, um, you know, following Rohit's death, what would you say, how far has the progress been towards accountability for his death and the other um, students as well who lost their lives? Zero. I mean, a zero, really. Uh, it's just uh, just so uh, shocking and just so, um, yeah, it's just so reprehensible on all counts, you know. Um, the thing is that um, it's, how, how do I put this? Okay, let me do the Rohit part first. Well, the Rohit uh, case really went nowhere because um, the... SCST Atrocities Act, which is which is one case that was filed, which is a case. Uh, uh, the act is is an act that uh, for any um, act of untouchability, uh, you know, uh, for example, untouchability is a crime in, in our constitution. So any so any practice of untouchability, and definitely the students felt this is a caste crime. Um, and the when the students actually um, put up the case, they it included you know union ministers, for example, that is central government ministers, uh, and it included the vice chancellor also of the university. Now the thing is, the they found a way to escape that by simply it's a legal slate of hand by simply declaring that since he is not a Dalit, this case doesn't apply. You know, meaning caste crimes can only be done if somebody is a Dalit in that sense. And they use that, uh, it's, it's really slate of hand because Rohit's father is, is not Dalit, he's another different community. And in the film, in fact, in the narration, I have that in the narration where I say the Supreme Court has had declared that a child of mixed caste parents can choose the caste, uh, you know, um, and um, and if they have experienced discrimination or they've been. And the thing is that Radhika Vemula Rohit's mother, because she, uh, you know, she left her husband pretty early on and she raised these children on her own and lived in a Dalit area and definitely they were raised in that way. But uh, that doesn't count, you know. I mean, that that didn't count in that sense. And the interesting thing about Rohit, I, I have to tell you, is that he didn't enter on a reserved seat. The university knew that he hadn't entered on a, uh, on a reserved seat. But because you have to submit your caste certificate in when you apply, they had his caste certificate. They had it for four years. 
not four years, more than that, 2010, okay? It's in their documents, no? So now to turn around and protect the vice chancellor and the union ministers, look at this slate of hand that they do. So that case went nowhere, but the abetment to suicide, which is uh, a stronger case, that is still on, but um, given the legal system, you know, it's very slow and, uh, okay, that is Rohit's case. But, you know, after that, there have been so many Dalit students, for example, the most recent one is an IIT, a first year student who uh, they say jumped to his death. But um, uh, so, you know, we keep hearing of these instances, right, of Dalit students in higher education who uh, and then if you look at what happens and how institutions just cover their tracks, you know, or say it's got to do with their mental health status or depression, you know, but it doesn't have to do with caste discrimination, right? And this has been a routine, if you like, cover for universities to escape any kind of um, blowback, you know, um, so, yeah, that is a very, very sorry state uh, of affairs, really. Um, On that note, actually, uh, there's been quite a lot of discussion on BR's caste census um, and how that could potentially be a tool uh, for combating caste-based discrimination. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? On that? No, no, I don't think it'll have anything to do with uh, battling caste discrimination. I think that the caste census is directly related to electoral politics because if you if the caste census reveals that certain castes are in much larger number than uh, than was assumed okay then they may demand a larger share in terms of uh, tickets to stand for elections or they demand a share in for example reservations in jobs or other things so but it's not, uh, those things have nothing to do with creating anti-caste politics, mm -hmm. right? Which is really the point. That, mm -hmm. I mean, that you have to have movements that tackle caste, which are really anti-caste movements, mm -hmm. you know? So, yeah. Okay. Um, speaking of movements, um, you were mentioning earlier as well that one of the um, points of change that you saw after Roy's death were these student groups that kind of mushroomed and that were anti-caste and kind of pushing for an end to um, caste discrimination in the university. Could you tell us a little bit more about these groups, you know, what the different kind of groups were and, um, yeah, what, what kind of work um, they doing? Well, I think mainly, uh, I see, the, the thing is that in certain universities for the uh, longest time, um, if you look at um, the strength of student organizations or membership in student organizations, um, you know, uh, you have, uh, well, certain, uh, for example, SFI or the left groups have dominated, okay? And... Uh, so one big shift has been that uh, many students have uh, sort of um, confronted these groups saying that uh, why, uh, why isn't caste a question um, in, in, their, in their politics or the way they look at student politics or um, so these conversations between saying that, you know, and it's all very well, you know, left politics, but what about caste? What about the question of caste? So I think these challenges have been raised by these student groups. Okay. You have, uh, for example, uh, the Ambedkar Students Association has, they have wings now in many universities, also not in Andhra and Telangana, which is where they began. Um, and there, you see, the, the and the other interesting thing is, I think the work of ASA is very interesting for me because it's also about security, even physical security for students from marginal group, marginalized communities. It's also about putting an end to bullying or, um, you know, what we call ragging, but actually it's bullying on campuses. It's also about 
creating a more inclusive space for other minorities to join, you know, including uh, Muslim and uh, Christian students, for example. So the kind of uh, politics that they want to do, which is much more inclusive, includes caste, but it is very inclusive in this sense as well, you know. Also, um, in the sense, I know that when um, Rohit was there, for example, the first time they started talking about um, LGBTQ questions, you know, uh, opening it up uh, even to the question of uh, trans, um, you know, transgender rights, for example. So I would say that these groups are very uh, different in that sense, you know, um, a different, I would say, political imagination, maybe, you know, and trying to implement it on campus. And, you know, the other thing is like, you know, when students from marginalized groups enter universities, there is a, it's a very difficult time, you know, how to negotiate even the administration. Mm -hmm. Where do you go? What kind of forms? How does it be filled out? How do you get your stipend? What is the, you know, and all, so much handholding happens by seniors or other people who, so though it's a political group, it's really also a group which is, um, supports students emotionally, uh, also supports students in navigating the system. So, yeah, so I would say their work is very interesting, you know, to me. I mean, when I, when I look at that kind of politics that they do. And um, politically, of course, uh, they are very anti-right wing. That's always been the case. Um, and they're also ready to call out um, uh, left groups or other groups which um, uh, on I issues of caste particularly, you know. So, yeah, so this is an interesting, I think, uh, I think a very interesting new kind of student politics, yeah. That's, that's very interesting. Uh, we have received quite uh, a few questions, right? I can, I, maybe I should look at them in the chat. I can, I can actually, I've looked at them. I'm going to ask you one about shooting the film first. Uh, how large was the film crew and how different was it uh, to shoot at a time when cameras, phones surround documentary subject as opposed to when phone cameras were not a thing? How different was it from shooting uh, Kya Hua Is Sarko from 1986 or 89th? Oh my lord, she's actually seen that film, this person? <laughs> That's from Oshi Jori, by the way. Huh. Okay. Um, okay, okay. Oh, how large was the film crew? It was a tiny film crew. It was basically me and my partner. Mm -hmm. And I tried to do sound and he was doing camera because, um, because you know, this kind of shoot is, is uh, you know, you to raise money to, to actually get a larger crew and to keep shooting like we did off and on for 18 months would have been unaffordable, you know? So, um, and basically it was just mainly the two of us and we would try and follow the story and, uh, you know, um, track what was happening as much as we could. Mm -hmm. um, okay, is this the thing about the is second this, part of the question is about how it's camera and phones and stuff. Shooting back then is different from you know when phones were not phone cameras were not a thing. Okay. How and shoot versus shooting now. Well, you know, one thing I have to tell you is that the this was I think one of the most uh, widely documented movements uh, visually because everybody was shooting. Students were shooting, uploading on Facebook. It was like uh, TV cameras were shooting. It was like, uh, so in a sense, it, you know, in all the films I've ever made, this was very tough. It was a very tough shoot because at any time there were at least 30 other cameras present. Mm -hmm. And very often the only place you could stand was where they were, they were standing. It was like shooting a public event, right? And many times while shooting, I would keep thinking, you know, our images and everybody else's images must look the same because we're in the same place. We're shooting basically more or less the same material. Of course, I mean, Navroz would, I would frame it beautifully or well or whatever, but still, you know, and quite often I, I would think uh, when we were editing the film later, you know, and 
thinking, well, everybody's going to say, you know, we've seen all this before. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you how do you make film where they can look at it afresh, uh, make meaning afresh? Because so, and it was a big challenge in a sense that because there was, um, I have to tell you this, this was a film where Navroz and I fought a lot over it because he kept saying, um, I, this is terrible. I, I can't shoot in these conditions, you know, people pushing and you're pushing and trying to get into a place and he says, it's all going to look terrible. You're not going to use any of it, you know, um, because there's just no possibility to um, shoot the way he does, which is beautiful, you know, doc, not beautiful in that aesthetic, but, you know, really uh, amazing documentary footage. That's what he's so great at. Um, and then I'd have to sort of cajole him and say, no, 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 but you know, let's keep going, let's keep going. It wasn't easy. It wasn't this easy. Shooting wasn't easy. The sound work was very tough because as I said, it was cacophony, you know, you had, you had a PA system, you had uh, people in the background, um, you know, so, you know, even cleaning up the sound took a lot of work. There was a lot of work doing that as well. But, um, but I just felt, you know, finally, look, how do you talk about aesthetics and filmmaking, right? And in documentary or whatever. I, for me, it always starts with what's on the ground. Now, what is the energy of this movement? And if the energy of this movement is, is the way it looks in this way, with sometimes the camera is shaky, sometimes it's steady, but, but that's how it was, right? Uh, so just go with it, you know, um, go with that. But I think mm, the challenge really was the, how do you tell a sort of emotionally affecting story when all your footage is of public events? Mm -hmm. You know, you, you have to put together an edit, which is, um, which people can connect to emotionally. It doesn't look like reportage, you know, it doesn't look like, stuff you've seen on Facebook, you know what I mean, of individual protests. And I think that edit was a real challenge. I mean, that that was a, a challenge, like how, how to put that together, you know, in a way that it's still, uh, that there's still a coherent narrative of what happened because by that time there were so many counter narratives and so much uh, delegitimizing of the movement and, uh, you know, uh, particularly, I think, on um, in Telugu uh, TV channels and Telugu media, there was a lot of, um, you know, a lot of things like pro the administration, pro the cha vice chancellor, that version. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, it became very clear that, you know, you, you have to respond to the existing media scape, right? Mm -hmm. Of what that narrative is. And then our narrative definitely had to be um, counter. To that you know so in a sense if you look at the form or uh, whatever you're very influenced you know the first time in my filmmaking where i was i had to act actively respond to what the existing story was mm -hmm. you know so yeah these were the kind of uh, challenges i think um and i don't know i, I have to ask uh, people i have to ask um some of you who are watching, I mean, did was it, how was the film for you? Like, I mean, um, did it, you know, not just in terms of, okay, the, an incident and the narrative, but also was it moving? Was it, uh, um, yeah, I think that's something. Yeah, it for me personally, it was very moving. I, I'd seen it in 2019. Yeah. Film, I think, yeah initially and it mm -hmm. was uh, and this was not something i knew anything about at all yeah. mm -hmm. uh, so it was definitely one of the uh you know sometimes uh something happens somewhere far away and you know nothing about it and then you watch a really good doc like, i've experienced this recently there have been interesting films made on the ca protest the 2090 protest yeah i've been submitted to film south asia this year and you know that's the exact feeling i can personally refer to you know because it also moves you and uh the this sort of movements really like emotionally moves you as well so it was it was a very moving film for me personally okay i'm glad because uh and also has to convey that that uh feeling you know of um mm -hmm. of what was happening yeah thank you for that deepa um 
We've also got a question from Sneha Krishnan, um, who's a professor at a university and is interested in, you know, how students reacted and faculty reacted uh, when you've screened it earlier across India. Um, how did they react to this film? I think overall very positively. I think very positively. Students very positively, definitely, uh, all over. It's, it's a... It's a film that uh, they screen. It was screened very widely across campuses. That that was there. Faculty. I only know about the um, reaction of faculty from Hyderabad, but because I'm not in touch with faculty from other places. But but faculty who um, you know who were supportive, okay, of the movement or whatever, felt it was a very fair. Um, uh, a very fair retelling of what happened, you know, um, and they did respond. They did respond positively. I haven't spoken to any administrators. Uh, administrators, I don't have a clue, really. Uh, um, also, I, I don't have much of a clue from uh, faculty who were, for example, with the administration on the Rohit struggle in HCU. I, I don't know what they thought uh, would have thought but my main uh, yeah the main feedback i've got is actually from students and that's been incredibly positive incredibly positive yeah yeah uh, and you, my, yeah I one thing i have to tell you about the students is that you know when we when the film was ready and um, and i thought a lot about it and um, and i thought that you know this film in a way really belongs to students, you know, this film. Um, so on his uh, second death anniversary, it was, and we sent messages to students in India, all, all over in many, many campuses. And we said, you know, if you want to screen the film, we'll send you the file. Okay. Um, but you have to take care of your security and, uh, you know, the security of the screening. And if you're up for that, we'll send you the file. And on that day, I mean, that that was just the most, uh, um, you know, exhilarating moment of my filmmaking career. We had more than 700 screenings on campuses in India. And that was like, um, you know, I really thought our thumbs were going to fall off. You know, you're just sending, madly sending, uh, sending the file to the students. And there were only three disruptions, which they managed. Um, you know, so and that's really not uh, because of the film as much, but it's because of Rohit and the movement. You know that they wanted, uh, they wanted to watch, and um, yeah. And then the feedback I got was uh, really, really fantastic. Yeah. Um, you touched earlier on the edit a little bit, and there mm -hmm. are like three questions on uh, the edit uh, from different people. I'm gonna read a little bit of one. As a film, as the film, how was the edit? Uh, how did you decide to form this narrative? As the film uses narration, Rohit's letter in first person, his Facebook post footage from different sources. How did you decide where to use these resources? In general, what is your post production process when the film has to be weaved into a narrative once you have all the footage? Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> well, the edit took a very, very long time. That's what I can tell you. Okay, but uh, okay about the edit. Now I have to say something about that too, which sort of links to the earlier answer I gave you, which is, you know, there was a, a somehow I felt, uh, you know, in this film that we were part of uh, a group that was documenting it. We, you know, there was a group called Dalit Camera who was filming. There was a, a student uh, who was filming uh, from HCU. Uh, there were, um, you know, it, it just felt that we was all part of this group, right? Okay. Um, and I just felt, can the film also reflect that sort of, um, that idea that, you know, uh, this somehow that it, there was this collective sense of recording and that can that reflect in the structure of the film that can you have a thing of saying somehow not it's not about giving credit or anything but it's saying this was a shared 
moment, you know. And th this is the first film, I think, of ours where uh, only about 70% of the footage is what we shot, right? Uh, and I felt that's important, you know. It's important to um, have material shot by students, shot by Dalit camera, his Facebook post, you know, include all that. So to me, that was very important also in the beginning. Like, how do you... Um, how do you include it in the way you you have conceptualized the film and then how do you physically create a structure that that sort of honors that intention you know um because we, it's not that we didn't have the footage of those sequences you know we did but i just felt mm, we should do it that way and so if you see in the film and this is also very unusual for me that i have tagged on the footage every time, like, you know, who's shot it and where it's from, the source and the, like a citation. It's actually on the shot, you know, uh, in the cut. Yeah, so I think there are many things like this uh, as to the form of the narrative. Uh, well, I've told you conceptually what I wanted, but well, how do you decide to use, where do you want to do it? Well, that just depends on how you want to tell the story. And I, in this, I really felt we had to also have a very clear, unambiguous narrative as to what happened. Mm -hmm. Right? That was very important. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I, so I think these are the things. But I tell you, editing is not easy. Editing is never easy. It takes forever. Many iterations. You can, uh, you know, it's hard. It's very hard, very tough. And, and we had so much material. I mean, we were filming for so long, so much material. Right now, actually, I'm, I'm putting all that material together in an archive because I feel it's good to have an archive of, mm -hmm. of that movement, you know. Because um, in a film, I mean, 80 minutes, what you use a fraction of what you've shot, right? What else is here? Uh, editing. Um, I'll, yeah, there's one more question from Nayantara. Um, so she's saying that, you know, as you said, they started with uh, the Buzafa Nagar documentary. Um, did you face pushback as well to your film because it also tells uncomfortable truths or did you anticipate that it might have uh, a negative reaction? I don't think we had any pushback, really. I don't think uh, we had any pushback. And as I said, even when students have screened it, I think only like, as I said, only three times or so people have, uh, you know, asked them to stop the screening. So, so far, no, um, not really. But uh, the, I don't know. I mean, it's really, you know, it's really up to how the students uh, present the film and, and, and want to screen it, right? It's really something where they have to take ownership of that, you know, when they a film like this. They have to screen it. They really have to uh, stand up for it in a way that they wouldn't maybe for other kinds of films. So, yeah, so I, I feel it, it's that kind of, it's a kind of um, partnership, you know? I mean, that once the film is out, you have to own, you have to own the distribution or the projection. And that's the only way it can be done, actually. It's the only way it should be done also, you know? Yeah. Um, we are uh, we are pretty much at the end here. Okay. Um, if someone wants to screen, like Stan Christian, uh, wants to screen your film, yeah, how, just yeah. What would be the best way to get a hold? No, of just uh, yeah, write to me. Uh, I'll okay. send you a link. Yeah. Okay. Um, um but uh, my my final question to you is: So, uh, are you working on a new documentary right now? Uh -huh. And what can you tell us about your latest project? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, there's some ideas, but nothing has. Um, uh, no, it, you know, I'm, I'm terrible. I'm very slow. I take a long time. Like, I don't know. I, I am thinking of something, but let's see. It's, it's, it's just um, the fact that uh, our audience members are having conversations about your older films, like one from 2003 and one from the 80s, yeah. is mm -hmm. a testament to your massive amount of work. So, you know. <laughs> Uh, so your two of your films have been re referenced in the chat so far. So thank you for your time, I guess, then.
Yeah, thank you for watching and uh, yes, great. And thank you for your work. I, you know, I'm always excited by any kind of South Asian um, possibility, you know, to meet or interact or watch stuff. And, and recently in Bangalore, when St. Joseph's, when they had this a series of films from uh, Film South Asia, yeah. it, was, uh, it was wonderful to be there. And because it's so hard for us to see each other's work. I mean, imagine we live in the same region. So more power to you, really. We have to have many more exchanges, I think, you know, region wise, really. And I would love if there were possibilities also for filmmakers to collaborate across uh, across regions. I'm just sending it out there. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. If anybody wants to, it would be fantastic, you know, if we could, uh, we could do that somehow, find a way to do that. Yeah. Yeah, so, that would be great. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. and hopefully we can we can foster more of those collaborations in the future. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. And yes, thank you everyone for joining and we hope to see you at future editions of Screen South Asia as well. We've just crossed um, a thousand members. We hope to add wow. more. Um, mm -hmm. So please, yeah, keep your eyes peeled. Send this around to people who are interested in film. And thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Deepa. Thank you.